Uh, some of the work I'm going to present today is primarily the work of a couple of other people, uh, Manuel Rigger and Matthias Grimmer at JKU Linz, but I'm, I'm working with them, and many other people um, I'll credit as we go along. Um, Oracle is giving this presentation, but it doesn't mean that we're going to build something into a product, so don't buy any Oracle products or stock based on what I'm telling you. It's, it's just a, a research project at the moment. So who we are, what we're doing. Um, if you're not aware, Oracle maintains a very large virtual machine called the Java Virtual Machine. Um, and I'm part of the academic part, or the, the academic research part of Oracle. Um, and we work on virtual machine technology ideas, which could go into Java, could go into other projects at, at some point in the future. We're quite a large team. There's about four times as many people as you see in that photo. That was from us from a, a summer retreat uh, last year. So it's a, a big project doing some big ideas, which, which could lead to some, some very big things in the future. Our, our tagline for the work we're looking at at the moment is something called one VM to rule them all. We want to look at uh, a single virtual machine which can support many languages. Um, and one of the reasons we want to support many languages is if they can all run on the same virtual machine, then we can optimize them together and use them together. And this talk is going to be about using Ruby with C together. Um, we're looking at many different languages, Java, of course, uh, but also languages like JavaScript, Ruby, R, um, and via our project called Sulong, LLVM. And then that allows us to support many more languages, because if your language can compile to LLVM, then we can run that LLVM on our virtual machine. We do this via several technologies. Uh, we run on top of the JVM, but we extend that with a technology called Graal, which is a new dynamic compiler for the JVM, so the JIT, co um, JIT component, and a framework called Chopper, which allows us to easily write high performance implementation of languages. It's a language implementation framework. We use that to implement all our languages. So what we really want to talk about is language C extensions. Um, these are really important part of many languages ecosystems and they provide a really interesting problem. I'm talking about meaning about languages that are dynamic, that are maybe a few years ago you would have called a scripting language, but these days they power such big important projects. It's perhaps a little unfair to call them a, a scripting language. Um, so languages like Ruby, um, JavaScript, and Python. Uh, Ruby is, um, they mainly use extensions, C extensions for performance and for interfacing with existing things like database drivers. In JavaScript, a lot of the Node framework is built on C extensions. And Python, particularly good example because there's so many of the scientific libraries are built on C extensions. And they're such a huge part of the, the Python ecosystem for so many people. I'm going to talk particularly about Ruby, because uh, Ruby is the, the language I work on and I lead the team implementing. Uh, but if you're not familiar with Ruby, you can just sort of squint at the code I'm going to show you and pretend it's either JavaScript or Python, and it'll work almost exactly the same. Uh, so I don't think it's too Ruby-focused. So this is an example of some Ruby code. It defines a method clamp. Um, it takes a, a number, and it returns it between a minimum and a maximum. And the way this is implemented in Ruby is they've decided to take an array, so that's an array literal of the three numbers, to sort them and then take the middle one. That's quite an elegant way to write a, a clamp routine, I think. It, um, it's points free, there's no, no variables in there. They're reusing existing core library routines to do it. The only drawback of this is it's very slow, of course. Um, you're allocating an array, you're sorting it to allocate another array, and then you're indexing it and throwing away both those arrays. So in many cases, this is going to be slow. Um, we can do quite well at optimizing this with our optimizing implementation of Ruby, um, but it's still it's likely to be quite slow. Um, and you're still wasting um, allocations, things like that, doing it if you don't have an optimizing implementation. So what people do when they have code like this and they find it's important is they'll write a C extension. This code actually comes from a, a library for processing Photoshop files in the image file format. And this is part of an inner loop of processing pixels. So this isn't some offline operation. This is being called for every pixel in your image as it processes your Photoshop file many, many times. So they realized, the people who wrote this library, that this was a bottleneck. And they did what most people would do in the, the Ruby, Python, JavaScript ecosystems, and they wrote a, a C extension instead. So this is a version in C, and it uses the, the Ruby API. So we have these value types, which are like opaque references to, to Ruby objects, um, numbers being objects in Ruby as well. 
Um, and it's got the same sort of signature apart from explicitly class self. Um, then they have to use some, some API calls to do things like convert the, the opaque number format into a, a C integer. And then they can use normal C logic to do it instead. So there's no allocation there. There's none of the, the overhead that you get with um, Ruby code. So that should be faster. Um, and they use this to speed up their, their code. As I say, people do this in, in many different languages. And this works. Look at this particular example and looking at the, um, the rest of the C extensions written for that library and another, one, another similar module that has lots of C extensions. They're called oily PNG for PNG files and PSD native for Photoshop files. And on average, they make the code around 10 times faster. So this is the performance operations per second. Taller is better, normalized the performance of the pure Ruby code and MRI, which is the reference implementation of Ruby is 10 times faster when we use these C extensions. Um, so that seems like a really great, we've achieved our, our goal there of making it faster. What's the problem with this? It seems like we, we produced a good solution there. Why is this something that needs to be solved? Well, the problem is that the API for writing these C extensions is um, a huge API that is essentially the entire internals for the reference implementation of Ruby MRI. Um, they, they more or less simply took all their internal headers and exposed them as an API. Um, and this means that lots of internal decisions about the way they've chosen to implement Ruby have become exposed and are being used by C extensions. And these aren't inherent properties of the language, these are properties of their implementation. For example, their implementation of string is a structure which is publicly visible. And they've got implementation details like the fact that you can have a, a string um, characters referenced or you can have them embedded if they're less than a certain size. And things like the fact that sometimes these pointers are shared or sometimes they aren't. This is all exposed to the, uh, the C extension. Another example is, this is from the, the OpenSSL C extension from Ruby. Um, you can see some more problems here. Um, for example, we've got this value str, and that means that we've got Ruby objects on the C stack. So that means we have objects we might want to move, might want to garbage collect, and now being stored on the, the manage on the, the native stack. Um, we've got our, our string object, and we call a method there which exposes that inner character pointer, um, and then passes it into some arbitrary C code which could do anything with that. So um, your, the way you represent your strings has been leaked out and it has gone anywhere. And the, the value is still in some pointer, so then we could pass that off to anywhere else again. Um, and these, these, um, these calls are often very much on the, the hot path of your program as well. Uh, we talked about the fact that this, this particular routine here, this clamp routine is being called for every pixel. I've exposed the Ruby code which calls it here. So there's a, a, a it's being, we're stepping through every pixel in the image. We're converting CMYK, which is a color space to RGB. And we do this logic and that's where the, the C code is called. So it's being called for not just every pixel actually, it's every, um, every channel within every pixel. So the, the, the calls from the Ruby to the C are extremely hot here. Um, but we've got things such as these conversions going on every time you do that call. So where we convert a Ruby value into an integer, it's being converted back and forth again and again and again every time we do this call, um, right on the, the hot point. So where you're trying to do as little work as possible, that's where you're doing that conversion. It's not just a point of problem with uh, strings. Um, if we look at something like arrays, we get a similar thing where we can, uh, we can call a, a Ruby API method R array pointer, and it gives you the inner array pointer to the array of value objects. Um, and then again, you can keep that around and you can then use it later on by doing C, index, C indexing instead of, um, instead of using methods to access it. Um, and this means that here it's very clear that the implementation of arrays that MRI, the reference implementation of Ruby have chosen to use, which is a flat array to represent Ruby arrays has been baked in because you can get the, the pointer, that's the only thing you can do. So if we'd like to do a more advanced version of Ruby, and if we'd like to replace strings with something else, maybe like ropes, or we'd like to replace arrays with something like maybe a, a nested data structure, like a try or something like that, then we can't do that because this code is expecting to see a certain representation of the program. 
Um, and it sort of baked into all those CA extensions because of this API. Previous solutions for this. This is a, a pretty well known problem because there's lots of alternative implementations of languages like, like Ruby. Um, there's JRuby, which runs on the JVM. There's Rubinius, which is just written in C++ and used to use LLVM as a JIT. Um, in a similar way that, that we were just discussing, V8 uses LLVM as a JIT. Um, and the solutions for them is they keep copying back and forth. So this is some code which is called every time they transition from Ruby to native and then from native back to Ruby. And each time they do this, they have to look at what objects you've referenced and if necessary, copy them back and forth between their internal managed representations and the external native representations. So this is the Java example from JRuby when they tried to support C extensions. Um, and here they copy the, the string from the Java managed heap into the, the Ruby, um, into the back into the Ruby managed heap, but have to transition the representation. This is because the Java wants to do advanced optimizations such as uh, a copying and moving garbage collector. But that doesn't work if your, your character, point, character pointer has leaked into native code. So they have to remember that you've got a native pointer and remember to copy it backwards and forth from Java back into Ruby, back into Java each time. And this quickly becomes a, a real problem because of this sort of thing is quite unbound. You know, you could have strings of any, any size you like. You could have gigabyte size strings. And each time you're crossing that boundary, you have to copy everything. Um, so really, it's, a, it's not a correct solution, I'd say. It's, it's going to break in lots of many cases. Our new solution, the big idea, is we're going to interpret not only the Ruby code, but we're also going to interpret the C code of your C extension. So we'll use um, an interpreter for C. But actually, we'll interpret the LLVM IR for the C code instead of interpreting the C directly as a simplification. Um, that also gives us the opportunity to run other languages than C. Um, but we're not just going to interpret, we're also going to JIT compile the Ruby and the C code in order to restore the performance that we lost by using the interpreter. And when I say JIT compiler, I mean a really powerful, really sophisticated state-of-the-art JIT compiler. We're going to use a single high and low level representation of those two programs, um, those two languages. So the, the Ruby IR and the CIR is going to be the same. Um, and we're going to forget which language the IR came from at a certain point in our compilation pipeline. And we're going to optimize them together and not care which language things came from. And then we're going to extract a little bit and we're going to give the, the C program, the ATA program, virtualized pointers. And we're going to let it think it's got real pointers to objects, but actually we'll give it something that's not quite what it thinks it is. So, Su Long is our LLVM IR interpreter, and Joe Richop is our implementation of Ruby. And I'll give you an overview of how they work. If you don't come from any kind of Java or small talk, anything like that background, um, the JVM has a, a VM called Hotspot, and you can write languages other than Java to target this. Um, but it's tricky because the, pretty much the only thing you can do is you can pour bytecode into the top of the JVM and hope it does something sensible with it. So, somewhere within Hotspot, but hidden and written in C++ and extremely complicated is a JIT compiler. And you can hope that your code will at some point reach that JIT compiler and something good will be done with it. Our big idea is that we're going to take the JIT compiler outside of that C++ code. We're going to rewrite it in Java. And then because it's written in Java, we can use it as a Java library as well as just using it as an opaque JIT. This means that you can talk back and forth to the JIT instead of having to just hope it does the correct thing. You can use it as a library. Um, but using a JIT is complicated, so we have this language implementation program on top, on top called Truffle. And I'll explain what Truffle is. Truffle is an AST interpreter. So you write just the, the IR that you deal with when you implement languages is just an AST, by which I mean it's a tree of nodes. Um, and each node performs some semantic action, perhaps calling some child nodes. Uh, one of the tricks we have is that it's a self-specializing AST. So your nodes will start out in an uninitialized state where they don't have any types. And as your program runs, we will specialize the AST for the types you're actually seeing. So this is how we do profiling. We do type specialization. So this is a, an example of a type lattice in JavaScript where it starts as an uninitialized, but if it either sees a string or if it sees a double or an integer, it becomes specialized for those. And that's how we make it a high-performance 
um, interpreter. The next thing we do is we take your specialized and typed AST and we compile it to machine code on your behalf. Um, and we do that using partial evaluation. If you're not familiar with what partial evaluation is, um, you can look at Tom Stewart's talk, Compilers for Free, and explains how that works. Uh, but essentially, it's a, a compiler that's written automatically for your interpreter. Um, so we can go away from your AST to the compile code without having to do any more advanced logic in between. And we can de-optimize. So we can go from the compile code back to the AST interpreter if we want to change the specializations later on. And then we can retype your code and we can compile it again after that. So we can de-optimize, compile again. Um, and this whole pipeline means that you can, you can change your program and it can respond to different types as the program is running. Um, your program then forms a, a graph of these ASTs for particular methods. And we can do things such as inlining by literally just modifying the trees and joining them together. So this is like our, our high level IR. If, you're, if a method is called with lots of different types, so it becomes very megamorphic, we can split and create multiple different copies of methods for different types. And we can inline those. So your program becomes as statically typed as we, we can make it uh, while it's running. This is all technology which will be available to use in Java 9. So Graal is our JIT compiler and it interfaces with Hotspot but we've made it so that just that, that little modification that allows it to use Hotspot is going to be released as part of Java 9, and then you can get the rest of our technology from Maven or something like that. So this is something you will be able to use at some point in the future. So Ruby. Our Ruby implementation is not a toy implementation. It supports 99% of the language and 95% of the core library. We support most of Rails, which is the... The, the core Ruby framework, although it is difficult to make actual Ruby applications run, but we're getting there on the components. And we run classic research benchmarks 10 to 20 times faster than competing implementations of Ruby do. Sulong is similar, so we take your, your C code, we compile it to LLVMIR, and it may sound funny to talk about writing an interpreter for LLVMIR, but really it's just a language like any other. We can look at each one of these lines as a language statement and execute it um, just like we would if we were running a, a basic program or something else that had one instruction per line. So how do we implement C extensions? Well, because if we compile both languages to this tree representation, this AST, well, then we can compile them together and we can treat them the same in the compiler backend. So which language your AST came from doesn't matter anymore. We can optimize them together. So in this example where we're talking about the arrays, the fact that we, we call our array pointer then get something that is your, your reference the array and that's stored in an SSA variable, well, we can store whatever we like in that SSA variable. It doesn't have to be just a raw native number. We can store a Java object in there if we want. Um, and then we can use whatever logic we like to implement load on that special Java object that was stored in that SSA variable. So you may think you have a void pointer in your C program, but actually you have a reference to a Java object, which can be anything you like. So we can store a reference to our Ruby array, which is a Drupal object, and then some offsets in it. And so you can you refer to an inner pointer even within a Java object through this technique. So if we have our, our string, which we think refers to a, a, the inside of a, a Ruby string, actually we can virtualize that, and we can say, actually this, what you think is a sharp pointer, refers to a Java object, um, and then intrinsic operations such as indirecting that pointer become method calls on the original Ruby string. So you think you're operating on a raw pointer and you're not, you're calling something on a, a Java object instead. So you look at the performance of this. We have to evaluate an earlier version of this work. So the Sulong work is, is being developed at the moment, um, but it's not quite ready to run all this bench, all the, the C extensions we talked about already yet. So what I'm evaluating here is something called Truffle C, which was actually an interpreter for the source code, the actual C. Um, we've moved on from this because we want to support more languages than just C, but we aren't able to run all the benchmarks yet because it's still work in progress, and we're showing results from that old implementation. And we're pretty sure the results will be similar as the compiled code for things we are running looks similar at the moment. Uh, so we think results will be similar. So this is for those same C extensions. Again, taller is better. It's speed up relative to pure Ruby. And remember that using the C extension was 10 times better than running pure Ruby code. 
The two existing techniques which do all that copying are much slower than that, uh, only around four or even just a couple of times faster in Rubinius, which is the LLVM one, and JRuby, which is the, J, uh, the JVM one, not using our technique. Um, and this defeats the point of using C extensions in many cases, the fact that it's slower um, than you would do running the reference implementation in Ruby. Using our technique, we're actually three times faster than running the native code. So JRuby plus Truffle with the C extension is three times faster than running the, the compiled native optimized um, extension. And the reason for this is because of that, that hot boundary you talked about where you're crossing method boundary from Ruby to native and you're having to unbox your numbers. That can be inlined across that boundary. So now you're not having to box or unbox anything because your native value, which has been optimized to store in a register, can stay in that register and it can stay in that register while you run the C code and everything. Uh, and we can show that the, the inlining is one of the most important things because if we turn off the, the cross language inlining, then performance is only about the same as the native code. So this allows us to, to optimize Ruby, to change the way Ruby represents strings and arrays, which is essential for making Ruby fast. We can't just rely on basic compiler optimizations. We have to rethink the way Ruby does basic things. Um, and it gives us that freedom because we can virtualize what the C extension thinks it's seeing to be what it thought it, the reference implementation of Ruby did, but really provide our own implementation of objects beneath that. So we get that native order of magnitude performance. Um, the uh, existing solutions are disappointing. Uh, we're three times faster than the native optimized code, um, and the cross language in inlining is the, the key point to that. You can get this technology today. Um, you can download what we call the Graal VM, which is Ruby, JavaScript, um, R, um, and a few other languages combined into a single package. It will include Sulong soon. It doesn't at the moment. Um, if you just search for OTN, Graal, you'll find that. Um, but it doesn't matter because all this stuff is open source anyway. So you can download our JIT compiler, Graal, um, Truffle, which is our language implementation framework, and Sulong, which is our dynamic runtime for Bitcode and Ruby, and you can try them out. As I say, this is the, the work of a really large group of people, um, particularly Matthias Grimma and Manuel Riga, who've worked on the Truffle C and now the Sulon work, and I'm working with them to put it on top of Ruby. Thanks very much. <laughs>